Hello, confirmation class. Today, we're going to be looking at our third lesson in the first article. So, per usual, I'd like to start with a little bit of review of the stuff we've talked about so far, just to keep it in your mind. I think we started with this question. It's where we began a couple of weeks ago. What is a creed? You know the answer to that by now, right? You've got to scribble down in your notes. You've got it stuck in your mind. When we stand up and speak the creeds on a weekend during worship or anytime, what are we doing? We're making a statement of faith. It's a statement of our belief. It's a summary of the core teachings of the church. That's how creeds function for us. We're not looking at the whole creed in this class. We will over the course of a year in confirmation. But in this class, we're looking primarily at the first article of the creed. So we've already been in this for a couple of weeks. What would you say? What's the first article of the creed about? Here's my answer. See how close yours is to mine. God is the creator, and I'm a part of his creation. Huge, huge, huge distinction. God's the creator. I'm a part of the creation. There's the text of the first article of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. He made it. Me included. You included. Everything included. Because God's the creator, and because you and I are creatures, part of his creation, we decided then that how we function inside of God's creation, how we use our lives, is something called stewardship. You remember what your definition of stewardship is? Here's mine. Let's see how close we are. Stewardship is taking care of something that belongs to someone else. Because God's the creator, everything is his, which means how we use anything is a part of our stewardship. It's a part of our how we respond to God for all of his wonderful gifts. We also mentioned that the first article of the Creed teaches us that not only is God the creator, which makes him incredibly powerful, super amazing, difficult to even imagine. We are also reminded that inside the first article of the creed, that God is also our father. Remember what was important about that? God loves his creation, and he's still connected to it, still taking care of it. We don't believe in some super distant, all-powerful God way, way far away who just created things and then let it spin. We believe that God cares about his creation so much so that he tells us that we can call him father. It's a relational kind of term. You don't call anybody father. It's a term that means, hey, we've got an important relationship. Stuff that we talked about last time. How can we use the time God gifts to us? The gift of time. We decided that we could use it poorly, wisely, foolishly, you know, well or poorly, wisely or foolishly, I should have, should have said. We can use time to honor God or to dishonor God. Here's some stuff that we talked about or that I had listed in your huddle last time. So you remember the huddle is when you pause this video and work through the verses that I've provided you inside of your workbook. We decided to look at this one chunk of our catechism and three Bible verses to say, what does it have to do with how we steward time? Third commandment, what do you have written down for that? Here's what I wrote down. This is totally true, by the way. Some people just don't get this. In my limited life experience, I find that some people either work too much or rest too much. It's really important for us though, that we learn how to balance these gifts that God has given us. The third commandment teaches us that Using God's time properly, it includes rest. Not to the point of laziness, but balance. If you rest all day every day, you're lazy. If you work all day every day, you're not following God's command to rest. It's not good for you. You're out of balance, out of whack. And living like that for very long is not a good thing. All right. Moving on then to the Bible verses. 1 Peter 4, 8 through 10. What does that say about how we steward time? What did you write down? Look inside your workbook. Here's what I wrote down. We should be good stewards of God's gifts. And 
we should use time to love other people. So not only is time not ours, it's God, God's. When we think about how we should use what God has given us, we shouldn't think about that only selfishly. We shouldn't think about how I should use it to benefit me. Just think about other people. That's important stuff. Next one, Matthew 20, 26 through 28. What'd you write down for that? Look back at the workbook. I wrote, we should serve others and think of them more than we think of ourselves. That's really difficult. Seems like we're pretty prone to thinking primarily about my experience in the world, what's happening to me, how I'm feeling. That's important, of course, but we need to push past that sometimes. Think about what other people need. How can I serve my neighbor? Not just the way I wanna do it, but what do they need? We should think about that kind of stuff. That's a really important part of stewarding the time that God gives to us. Matthew 25, 31 to 46, big long chunk of the Bible. Made you read 15 whole verses. What did you write down for it? Here's what I got. We should give time to God's work even when it's not convenient for us. You probably had something similar. Might not be exactly the same. That's okay. This is a big long chunk. Probably a lot of different ways to answer that. That's true. When we talk about being a steward in church, we don't just mean giving an offering. That's important, but it's not all of it. Also, how do we use the talent and the time that God gives to us to serve other people, to bring glory to him? It's important for us as followers of Jesus in this world to realize that he doesn't call us only to convenient things, things that are easy to give up. He calls us to difficult things. That's important. All right. Next page inside your workbook, topic for today, how do we steward money? Ready? Here we go. First question. I want you to say out loud the answer to this. What do you think the answer to this is? What does God have to do with how I use my money? What did you say? Did you say this? It's not my money. That's right. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about how we take care of God's stuff that he's gifted to us. It's almost like it's on loan. How do we take care of the things that actually belong to God that he lets us use? So that's right, it's not my money. I gotta stop asking bad questions like this. It's not my money, it's God's money. Here's an interesting question. How do you get money? What do you think? Can you think of three ways that you get money right now? Birthday cards, parents' wallet. You ever had a pile of money delivered to your door in the morning? Just like dropped off? That doesn't work for you? That's not how it goes? Don't got a money tree in your backyard? So how do you get money? Most of you said that you get it from your parents, and that's true. Most of you are too young to work, shouldn't be working too much unless you get paid for chores or helping out your neighbor or a grandparent or something. So most of you get money from your parents. That's right. Let me ask another question. How do your parents get the money? They also don't have a money tree. They also don't have bags of it dropped on the front porch in the morning. Here's how money gets to you. God provides for us by giving us family. Maybe it's important to remember too that God provides for our parents by giving them jobs. Tough to remember sometimes, but as a parent, we're supposed to remember that our job is a gift from God. Not only is our job a gift from God, but the things that God has formed in me and you to have that job, those are gifts too. So if you have a certain skill, that means you can have a certain job. You should remember that God gave you that skill. So God gave you that skill. He gave you that job and he gave you resources. See, that's how God provides for us. Here's what I want you to think about. This is why I keep beating on this. I believe that the money that I have is provided 
to me by God. And yet it does not miraculously appear on my front porch every morning. You see, that's how God often provides for us. He provides for us through, you see the word I got bolded there, means. What does means mean? Well, thanks for asking. I think that's my next slide. Means means that God often works through the normal stuff of this world to provide us with stuff. Do you remember when the people of God were leaving Egypt on their way toward the promised land? God provided them food every single day, miraculously. There was some kind of flour-like substance on the ground that they could make into bread. There were birds on the ground so they could eat meat. That's how God provided for them. Well, see, I still think God provides for us, but he provides in a different fashion. It's less miraculous than that, but we shouldn't be less thankful. For everything we have, we should be thankful. So when I think about my job, even on hard days of my job, I should be grateful. Grateful that I have the skills necessary to do the job, that I have an employer willing to hire me. And I should remember that God has provided all those things for me. See, God works through the normal stuff of this world to provide for us. He gave you family. If you're too young to work, you should be thankful that you have a family that provides for you. That's important stuff. All right. So here's a couple of open questions. We talked about this last time, similar kind. If we can use time either to honor God or to dishonor God. Sorry, I said time. I meant money. If we can use money to either honor God or dishonor God, what are, what are things that fit inside those categories? Can you think of a couple of options? Let's start with the honor God one. How can we use money to honor God? I wonder if maybe one of the first things you thought of was giving money to church. Usually when I'm teaching, that's the first thing that people say because they know that's important to me. And that's true. I, I give money to church. I give, uh, I don't know, I give about 10 or 11% of my income before taxes to the offering at Zion. I think that's important for me to do, an important way for me to be thankful to God for the gifts that he's provided me. That's certainly a way to use money to honor God for sure. But there are other things too. Do you think of other things? Well, let me ask you this. Because I'm a husband and a father, when I make sure that money is set aside each month to pay the bills so that my family can live comfortably in that house, do you think that honors God? God gave me them as a family, gave me my role as husband and dad. Do you think paying bills honors God? I think so. Doesn't always feel fun, just so you know. Sometimes, sometimes in life we're called to do stuff even if it doesn't feel good doesn't feel good for me to send money to somebody else, but it does feel good to know that I'm providing for my family. As I get ready to uh, send one of my kids to Lutheran High School, using some of my money, God's money, using some of the money that God gives to me to provide an education for my kid, is that a way to honor God? He gave me that child, one of his children to live in my house, I think it does. How about being generous with people around you? Is that important? I think so. If someone's in need, help and take care of them. Have a family member or a friend who is struggling. If they ask me for help, I'd give it. Absolutely. Help any way that I could. So there's lots, lots of different ways to honor God with the money that he provides for us. How about dishonoring God? How about the flip side? Anything come to your mind there? Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I've been teaching confirmation long enough to know what junior high students usually say when I ask inside class ways to use money to dishonor God. They almost always just say the reverse of all the things we listed in honor God. So if I said it honors God to give an offering, they'll say hmm, dishonor, not give an offering. True. They'll also be like, ooh, you know what? Gambling. Gambling's bad. That's a terrible way to use the money that God provides you. Probably true. So what other ways that we dishonor God with the money that he provides? 
You know, one of the things that I think is an answer to this question is that if we are just too selfish with the money that God provides, if we forget that it's from him, if we think that it's all about what I've earned and so that I should use it all for me, I don't think that's right. I think you and I need to think more and more about the needs of the people around us than maybe what we're accustomed to. That's an important thing to remember that what we have is a gift from God and then to use those gifts to bless other people. I think that's important stuff. Yeah, kind of a hard question here. I forgot this slide was in here, but I'm glad it is because this is a good one. What personal blessing comes with giving? You know, there's actually a couple. Now that I think about it, the last time I taught this in class, I remember what some of my students said. One of the things that my students said when I said what personal blessing comes with giving, they said it feels good. And that's true. Totally feels good. If you've never experienced that, you should try sometime. Finding someone who's in need and helping provide for them. We do that all different kinds of ways in church. Sometimes like when we get ready to approach Christmas time, we'll put little tags in the back for families that are in need, kids who wouldn't have maybe an exciting Christmas morning without help. I love shopping for those families. Love buying toys and pajamas and giving gift cards. It just feels good. I never get to see those families open those gifts, but it feels good. It feels good knowing that I'm helping. So that's, that's true. That's not even the one that I have listed, but that one's true. Maybe you thought of that. Here's another personal blessing that comes with giving. Contentment. I want you to know something. It's important for me that you know this. Some versions of the church wrongly teach that if you're generous with your money, that God will bless you with more money. That might be true sometimes, but it's not always true. It's not a math equation. Here is the blessing that comes, though, when we give. We learn to be content. And guess what? You heard it here first, folks. Contentment is the secret of life. Here's a crazy thing. I'm not sure if you knew this. There's all sorts of talk nowadays about what responsibility rich people should have. Should they give more, provide more? Those are interesting conversations. But did you know this? Of all the people who have lived of all time, I can't remember how many people are in the world right now, seven and a half billion or something like that. Of all the people who have ever lived, did you know that you are one of the richest 1% of people who ever lived? Do you not feel rich? Let me tell you a couple of historical definitions of being rich. You ready? Let me see how many of you fall into that category. When you go to put on shoes in the morning, do you have a choice? I do. I wore my Brooks running shoes. I guess when I wear them, they're more like walking shoes, but I wore my Brooks running shoes today. I could have worn my Keen sandals. And that's just the choices of shoes I wore so far this week. I got brown dress shoes and black dress shoes. I've got brown boots and also some hiking boots. Options, options, options. Ooh, I almost forgot my snow boots. Options, options, options. Ooh, I've also got my lawn cutting shoes. And I've also got a pair of shoes that's sort of halfway between the shoes I wear right now, my lawn cutting shoes. How many pairs of shoes was that? Did you keep track of that? I didn't, but I know it's more than one. You know what that makes me? Historically, rich. Let me ask you another question. Do you have your next meal guaranteed? I don't mean planned. I don't mean cooked. I mean, do you have enough food in your house to be fed for another meal? If so, guess what? See, I do. I've got a pantry full of stuff. I've got a fridge full of stuff. My freezer's full of stuff. 
I've got so much stuff in my freezer that I've got a freezer downstairs. That freezer is so full of stuff. I've got meat in my father-in-law's freezer. Guess what? My next meal, guaranteed. Also, my pantry is so full that I've got canned goods in my basement. I call it my backup pantry. Do you have crazy stuff like that going on? Now, I'm not asking if you like the food in your fridge, freezer, pantry, or backup pantry. What I'm asking you is if you were on the verge of starvation, would you have calories inside your home? Is your next meal guaranteed? Guess what that makes you? Rich. Here's what I'm trying to say. We've got a ton. And yet, we tend to want more. Contentment comes from looking at what we got being thankful to God for what we have and showing our thankfulness by giving a portion of it away. What I've tended to find in my life is that the only way you can know that you have enough is to give some away. Some people who wonder if they have enough go buy more. Guess what? That has a 0% success rate in the history of the world. Buying more will never make you feel like you have enough. You know what will make you feel like you have enough? Give some of what you got away. Contentment. The more stuff that I give away, the more thankful I have for what I have, the more I aim those thank you prayers to God to say, Lord, you have been so tremendously generous with me that not only can I take care of myself, I can take care of my family, I can also help take care of others. That's why I give an offering every single week to church. That's why I give 10 plus percent of my family's income before taxes to church, because it helps me be content. If you aren't content, you should try to find something like that out. Go look through your closet, see if you can give 10% of what you got away. Go look through your pantry, find a food pantry in the area, give some of what you got away. Do the same thing with your check account. Look at what you got, say, you know what? I've got all this. I'm one of the richest people who's ever lived in the history of the world, and yes, yeah, not enough for me. I can tell you how it could be enough. Give some away. Hey, another question. This is kind of a weird word. You see that word on the screen? First fruits. Probably not a word you've ever used in conversation. It's a Bible kind of word. You know what first fruits means? It means that we're supposed to give God his portion before we keep our portion. Here's what I'm trying to say. Sometimes in life, we gather all that we have, see that we have left over, and we hand some to God. That's not what he calls us to do, though. God calls us to give to him first. How come? Well, it's because it's an act of faith that God will keep providing. So you think about the way someone who lives off the land would be. Let's say you backed up in the world 100 years when all of the food that you ate came from your property, your animals, your crops. God called on those people to take the first portion of what they had and give it away. How come? Faith. Help them learn to trust God for what's coming in the future. All right, hope you wrote all that down in your workbook. Now it's huddle time. So as you know, because you've been through these videos before, huddle time, I want you to pause right now, work through those, what is about seven Bible verses that I have for you. I want you to write down on your workbook what each one of those verses has to do with your stewardship of money, and then unpause, and I'll be talking for a few minutes to get us ready for journaling time. So pause now. All right, you finished your journaling assignment. As you know, we are still inside the book of Genesis. Over the past couple of weeks, we looked at God's creation. Then we looked at Adam and Eve sinning in the Garden of Eden, the fall of humanity. We also looked at the flood. This week, we're looking at some important moments with God and Abraham. Starts off, by the way, his name's Abram. Gets a name change part of the way through his life. Here's what I want you to know. This is kind of the big idea that we're looking at before you jump into your journaling section. Throughout the Bible, one of the words that we use to describe God's relationship with his people is a word called covenant. You know what a covenant is? 
It's like a shared promise. You promise me something, I promise you something. It's like a contract. I will provide you this, you give me that. God uses covenants throughout his dealings with his people. But something that you're going to see as God works with Abraham is that the covenant is pretty one-sided. Abraham doesn't do much to stay in a relationship with God. God's the one who really keeps us in relationship with him. Even when we try to walk away, even when we fall away, God brings us back. I want you to see that. God makes some crazy promises to Abram. I do want you to keep your ears open for kind of the one thing necessary that Abram needs to stay in a relationship with God. So per usual, start working your way through your journaling sheet. Remember, the only wrong answers in journaling are blanks. I want to read what you're thinking. So make sure you take some time. I would prefer 12 word answers to two word answers. I'd prefer 24 word answers to 12 and twos. Think on the paper. Go for it.